So hi to one and all once again. Uh, welcome to this press conference organized by the Vitality Health Network. Before I, before going any f further, I'm Sarah Noel. I'm Regional Director of Communications for the Vitality Health Network. I want to introduce to you several of uh, the staff leadership uh, team of the Health uh, Network who are here this afternoon. We have Mr. Gilles Lanteng, uh, pre President uh, and uh, as the CEO, Mr. Charles Lozier, to my extreme uh, right, is the Chief of Operations and VP to Professional Practice, Academic Affairs and Research. And then Madame Gisèle Beaulieu, Chief of Operations for uh, Northwest Zone and VP to Quality. And after that, Dr. France de Rosier, who's our uh, Medical uh, Health Officer, and my, Mr. Jacques Duglot, Chief of Operation for the Rest of Zone and VP to Public Health. And finally, Mr. Stéphane Nagassé, Chief of Operation for the Academia Bathurst Zone and VP to Technologies of Information on Health. So without any further ado, I would like also the presence among us of Dr. Daniel Dutureldi, who is the medical director for the Beausejour Zone, and also uh, Dr. Neil Branch, who is the medical director for Acadie Bathurst Zone. Without any further ado, I invite Mr. Gilles to present uh, the vision of uh, the uh, Vitality Health Network for the future of healthcare in our region. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-René. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, uh, I have a voice, I think, that uh, my little, my daughter uh, gave me something. You know that the department, uh, that the, uh, the government is in a uh, process of revising its uh, programs and health is uh, co uh, an important co contribution to uh, the public uh, expenses. So the objective of the department must include efforts in the, f in, the health of, in the health field. We want to establish the best way to organize our services within this framework and what we want are high quality services in opportune time and we want the, them to be uh, focused on the needs of the population that they are viable both clinically and financially speaking so the context is uh, uh, we uh, uh, must serve the expectations of the public uh, we know that the uh, healthcare system contributes to the improvement of the uh, health status of the population, that, and they must offer services that uh, fill their needs and that they be managed in a viable fashion for the future generations. So we uh, see a, a good alignment with uh, what we do. We must know that there is really uh, a lot of room for improvement in New Brunswick with regards to health care and social services. So the context is that uh, we've articulated uh, what uh, we've uh, called a uh, chance and opportunity that we've seen to transform and modernize the health care system in a report uh, which was given to the minister. And the changes are uh, not quite necessary and, and uh, what we foresee as transformation will allow us to do things differently and improve. Uh, fragmented uh, uh, parts of the report were uh, rendered public. We must say that we're not surprised that these information have circulated. It's quite normal. It's not a report or an opinion that we gave to the minister or the department. Uh, we prepared it with a lot of interveners. Uh, we've discussed uh, with clinicians, a lot of members uh, internally, and we've discussed with a lot of uh, community partners. So the fact that some elements have come out uh, uh, really did not surprise us. Uh, however, we have the impression that the report uh, um, uh, might have been uh, uh, more uh, developed with uh, elements, uh, with all in all its uh, in its elements, uh, without sensation. So we're taking this occasion today to give you more information and content uh, uh, of that particular report. So we want to present our vision, and our vision is to to modify our healthcare system 
uh, deeply. And the central element is a change toward primary health care, community uh, services, and uh, ambulatory services. Uh, so we'll have to in, uh, accept to invest in less uh, sectors and much more in others for the trans transformation today and for the future of the uh, network. So, it is always an approach that is uh, patient-focused. The new model is uh, uh, works around three uh, principles, a better use of our resources, improve our clinical practices, and have increased operational efficiencies. So, if we want to uh, sum up uh, the whole of the mission, it's uh, uh, have uh, changes to ho the solution of hospitalizations. Uh, and uh, the healthcare system did not adapt to the uh, aging of the population and emergence of chronic diseases. Uh, uh, the uh, New Brunswick is the uh, province that uh, is uh, aging more between two, uh, 2005 and 2011. It's, uh, a, a great increase of the population at 65 and older, and that has increased even more in the last uh, couple of years. So, uh, which confirms what we have to do as leaders. So, uh, patients need alternatives uh, to address the problem of access at the right time and uh, in the appropriate setting. So, what we must do is reduce frequency of hospitalizations, the length of stay, and the number of consultations at the emergency departments. Uh, those are the three that we want to address. So what we want to do or propose is to optimize extramural program services uh, that you know, uh, which started in the beginning of the 80s. New Brunswick was a pioneer. It was the first uh, jurisdiction in Canada that implemented such a system. Uh, so we want uh, to uh, copy a bit what's going on in Ontario and Quebec and create what we call a uh, virtual hospital and what that might mean as a virtual hospital is to maintain people in their milieus, uh, people whose health are fragile, people who are really sick but for whom we can offer services to prevent hospitalization and emergency visits. I'll give you examples in a few minutes. So if we know that somebody needs to come to the hospital, for certain diagnostic tests, and if that person has to go on a waiting list so that these tests are not available uh, within the next couple of weeks, with a virtual hospital, what could happen is that there's taking over of these people, again, knowing their condition, health conditions, there could be an access that's more direct to some diagnostic services, which would allow uh, to uh, for these people to spend less uh, time in a hospital and have a, a quicker access to these services. You know that today there's about 24 percent of beds that are occupied because of other levels of the care. People who have uh, finished their stay, uh, their short-term stay, but must wait for uh, in the hospital uh, and, and wait a placement in a nursing home. These people, it, it has been shown, if they stay a day more in the hospital, if their situation is not improving, they have a tendency to overcompensate and for each day of hospitalization, it needs, you need two to recuperate. So somebody stays in a hospital for one month too much, uh, you can see the problem that it uh, that it brings out, and people don't have any o other options than to go to long-term care. There are also situations where people, uh, we uh, physicians could give them uh, discharge them, but because uh, a lack of a better organization, there's a, a challenge to give them a discharge. But it could be people that would have a need access to. Uh, better technological services, and instead of waiting uh, on the Monday, if we're on the Friday, if they could have access uh, 
to allow the, per the patient to return and uh, on Monday to have access to those exams. They, you could discharge them and, they, and therefore uh, decrease their length of stay at the hospital. So what we're proposing as well is to uh, better control and coordinate interventions uh, uh, in the hospital milieu and have uh, close cooperation with the Department of Health, uh, social development and nursing homes to reduce the number of seniors who are hospitalized and waiting for uh, beds. There are provinces that obtain phenomenal results uh, at that level because, uh, uh, among others in Saskatchewan, uh, where the healthcare level, people who are waiting at hospital, is at 7%. Quebec also has known uh, very good uh, successes. Ontario at provincial level, they're at 13%. We, with 24%, uh, we are, uh, it means we have a system that is challenging in that way just to free up those beds uh, would allow a better flow internally and have access to beds when uh, doctors at emergency need to admit people and ultimately we would it would avoid to have people like uh, in uh, on stretchers in the hallways uh, for 12 to 4 24 hours at a time as to emergency services with important uh, uh, improvements there is about 450 people Today, if we have an average that could be seen outside the hospital milieu, what this means is that there's a culture, people have a culture of going to emergency uh, when they need uh, quick access, access uh, but they don't have all the other alternatives that could exist or that we could put in place to avoid these people from going to the emergency department. It also uh, means that for somebody who's seen uh, at emergency and needs uh, 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 intravenous therapy on a Friday. If we can't put those services in place on Saturday uh, in the home. These people must uh, come back to emergency on Saturday and possibly on Sunday and wait long hours at emergency. So there is a, a way of doing things better in organizing and coordinating these services which would allow a decrease of people. The stats that you see there, over 60 people who I think of uh, levels four and five of care. These are levels where people could receive services uh, at emergency. Some people have started in their practice, some doctors, to uh, have uh, some uh, services if somebody uh, something happens in a home instead of going to the hospital or emergency service, they call. And since there are programs that are already scheduled, it, uh, it would avoid hospitalizations or emergency visits. And it's the type of system we would like to put in place. On a short term, however, uh, what we have seen in uh, the options that we're for, uh, foreseeing uh, to close some emergencies, we believe in our document there's uh, that has circulated partially on a short and uh, on a uh, short and medium uh, term uh, we can m make better use of emergencies uh, and uh, these alternatives are not put in place yet so for the analysis of functioning of services emergency services and to be more efficient and effic ha have an efficacy and if we need uh, uh, some types of emergency we can do that at that time uh, once uh, everything else is better developed. As to clinical practices, uh, we think that we can re-examine our uh, healthcare delivery and according to our knowledge and to question our traditional approaches. Uh, there have been improvement at all over Canada, some uh, uh, best practices where organizations can look into how they can organize their systems and uh, uh, processes so as to be uh, more efficient uh, as to clinical practices to uh, bring in our professionals and uh, healthcare professionals or doctors for and their expertise to transform the system. What we're proposing is to reduce exams, diagnostics, and 
and uh, we must uh, put in implements uh, uh, elements into a place uh, for treatments and processes that are not useful. And it has been shown in Canada and elsewhere that uh, you can reduce uh, the diagnostic exams. Uh, some people will say, well, it's 20, uh, 25, 30 uh, percent of exams that can be reduced. Alternatives exist at that level. So as to be able to do that, we must improve our ways of doing things and offer uh, physicians uh, the knowledge and expertise uh, necessary. Uh, so that they can arrive uh, to that. Now we want to de uh, demedicalize uh, the end of life care. Demedicalize end of life care, and that too, all provinces in Canada have looked at the different strategies, and New Brunswick is doing that uh, for end of life care. Some regions in Canada have arrived to a point where 80% of people who want to die in their home can do it. So let's uh, let's say we could intervene in homes, uh, it, then you could avoid hospitalization and emergency visits, and people who are hospitalized uh, die at the hospital, and it's not their first choice, and we could be able to offer uh, a gamut of services uh, to fill the needs of the population, it would be less costly. That has been shown as well. And finally, that would fill probably a mission within the health services uh, where there are improvements to be done. Uh, there's also in uh, uh, kidney uh, problems in Scandinavian countries, uh, 30 people of people who have to receive uh, a dialysis uh, services and can do so at the, uh, within their homes. It is a field where there's an increase of that demand year after year. There are regions uh, where it's uh, ep uh, in epidemic uh, proportion, so we have to look at is there a better way of servicing these people with other means that are uh, less uh, invasive and uh, in offering what we can call uh, the uh, peritoneal uh, dialysis. And perhaps if we all got together, there might be a way of uh, uh, increasing uh, kidney transplants. So the situation as to uh, operational, important operational effic efficiencies, some can be put into place uh, through new technologies every day. There's uh, new discoveries, new things coming on market, and new knowledges that are developed, and we want to optimize uh, telehealth. And there's also as to the transcription and uh, voice recognition that can increase efficiencies in the system. And with these alternatives that we talked about earlier, the next steps, uh, the document, as you know, uh, it was uh, given to the Department of Health, and we are awaiting the decisions, uh, departmental decisions, not health-wise, but administratively. Uh, they want to do revision of their programs, and uh, we also work with the internal teams of the network to uh, put in place uh, uh, action plans that are quite detailed. We're pers pursuing our consultation. We met people with all in all the regions of uh, Vitality. Uh, we went to St. Quentin, Grand Falls, La Mecque. We met with uh, the mayor in Kent and uh, people uh, in the mayors in uh, Restigouche, and uh, a lot of consultations uh, were held. And what we've heard up to now, that nobody says that uh, we can't do better. Uh, quite the opposite, suggestions have come from all over. At the same time, what people tell us, uh, well, we would like to participate a bit uh, in the development of these solutions with you. So we're putting into place uh, the continuation of these discussions in a peninsula. There will be another consultation with representatives. And we continue with the medical team and uh, the uh, CEOs and uh, people in all regions to pick up ideas. And also, we've had things in the past as to consultations we've done, a lot of information that is there already. And it's just a question of implementing it 
through plans that can be developed quite quickly uh, as soon as we have the okay from the department as to our orientation and vision as to transformations we want to implement. Of, of course, uh, things will not uh, be uh, up to par. We're, we're looking at a, an implementation period of 12 to 18 months uh, because it has to be done in the right way so that it won't increase uh, expenditures, but it will be done at the same time where savings can be uh, generated uh, and allow us to attain uh, the objectives of the department. In conclusion, of course, we're going to participate uh, with the efforts of the province and uh, to transform and modernize uh, the healthcare system. And that's why we're looking towards the future and we believe that these services uh, will be able to really be improved and improve uh, the capacity of uh, uh, filling the needs of, of our present and future populations. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mr. Lantang, for your presentation. So we will now go on to the question and answer period. Period. As mentioned before, you can use the microphone to make sure that you are heard uh, by all interveners. And you can also ask questions in the official language of your choice. Questions to Mr. Lantang. Dr. Desrosiers, who are uh, one of the other person present in the official language of your choice. Alors, si vous... So uh, you could start by identifying yourself and indicate uh, which media you work for. Thank you. Mario Mercier. Vous allez toucher, uh... Mario Mercier, les toiles. You've touched upon the habits of people and changes in the uh, people's habits. Uh, what is your strategy to accompany them and, uh, and educate them? Because uh, it will be quite a turmoil, a major turmoil in the changeover. It is going to be uh, quite a big change, as you say, but at the same time, uh, people uh, are familiar with uh, the change, ambulatory changes. It is not a concept that is new, at least uh, with regards to transformations that we've heard from reforms that were done in New Brunswick and re reforms in Nova Scotia. So what we need is to establish communications and in our transformation plan, it's interesting you bring up that point, uh, there is a complete chapter on how we're going to communicate and with whom we're going to communicate. There are changes, there, there are customs that are quite rooted and it's in educating and in exchanging and in communicating uh, with the, re the municipal representatives and local uh, representatives and associations. Anybody else wish to add something? I think the CDOs may have something to say on that. In the zones, there's already a lot of uh, communication sectors and organizations who are good uh, spokespeople and can transmit that message as well. Uh, qu quite well. Uh, there, there are already community groups that exist in our localities, and uh, we're constantly in contact with these people, and it's important for us to remain transparent in what we're undertaking. And I think we have uh, the confidence uh, from them, and that's what we want to uh, transmit. Gilles Thériault, SKRO. Uh, we've heard about the uh, bed cuts in the province, 41 in Acadie Bathurst. So what are you talking about exactly? Is it part of the report that you gave to the Department of Health? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's part of that. And the exact uh, uh, sh uh, figure is 99 that are spread out in the four zones. Uh, all the details will be filtered out. I think there were uh, precise uh, data that were communicated. Uh, however, what uh, we insist that we don't see that as closures, but rather a chance to transform and modernize services. So these beds are beds uh, uh, that we've kept to use. Uh, what we looked at that are 
uh, avoidable hospitalizations as long as there are alternative care uh, that are in place to avoid those hospitalizations or uh, the length of stay. Uh, so the number of days that a person spends in the hospital and we are absolutely uh, assured that these figures uh, make a lot of sense because if we compare to other Canadian provinces, some have succeeded in going uh, well over that uh, 99, which would represent uh, that would be representing uh, our figures here. So uh, all in all, after the 99 would be transported to ambulatory or community services, that we will still have uh, more beds per 10,000 population uh, than uh, as is the case in other provinces. So we're quite quite safe. All of that work is to follow up on things that were uh, that the former CEO Rino Volpe had put into place. Uh, how do you believe that your healthcare professionals, uh, physicians, uh, nurses, the LPNs as well, all these people are overworked. Uh, we c must not hide our heads in the sand. How will they succeed to, to uh, overcome all of that surplus you'll be giving them? If you will allow me, we'll take an example because the patients we're talking about are patients that could uh, receive the services that we give in the hospital beds right now at home or elsewhere. If you take the main diagnostics tools that justify hospitalizations today, it's uh, pulmonary uh, uh, OBCs or di diabetes. Uh, well, a person who is uh, unbalanced because of diabetes, it can't, uh, doesn't need uh, to go to the hospital. Uh, we are lacking uh, extramural resources because that work is being done at home by extramural. So we're looking at uh, uh, a change, a shift of services towards ambulatory uh, care and home care uh, where you don't need to be hospitalized. Uh, and Mr. Lausanne, way, if they, they might be uh, in a bed and a loss of uh, autonomy, uh, but uh, then you go into a, a vicious circle. If you can just please explain the rationalization behind the transformation of the, the 99 beds in the health network, please. Well, uh, what, what it means is uh, on a gradually over a period of uh, a year, year and a half, it's, it's closing uh, 99 beds within the whole Vitalité network. So those beds, uh, what remains to identify is which establishment uh, right uh, to now. We've uh, identified the zones, and from these zones, uh, with plans that are more precise, uh, knowing exactly which services and where we'll implement these services, we'll be able to, to uh, close them uh, gradually. Sorry, you, you don't have a... Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, so what, what it means is over a period of between 12 to 18 months, what we would do is, be, is, is closing these beds in uh, institution or in hospitals that uh, still need to be uh, precisely identified because right now we have them in zone. Some of the zones have three hospitals or two hospitals, so there's some fine work to be done there. But what we looked at is... Uh, what we call the uh, hospitalizations that are uh, avoidable. Uh, so, if uh, by by being by putting in place these mechanisms or these services, that will prevent these hospitalization one or shorten the average length of stay in these hospitals. What we'll be able to do is just transfer these services. So, what we've proposed to uh, to the minister is to close these 99 beds but recuperate half of the savings that these, the closure of these beds uh, will generate so that we can invest in these, in these services that we feel are much more appropriate to the needs of the population uh, and that, that will meet their, 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 their needs a lot better and that are less costly. So it's, it's quite surprising in Canada. Uh, there's been numerous studies. There's been a number of research on that, whether by the Canadian... Uh, Quality Council, uh, in, by the uh, Canadian Home Care Association, home care and staying and alternatives to hospitalization cost less, 
and this is what people want. So it's, it's a really win-win situation from our, our perspective. So that's why we're, we're proposing this transformation and modernization. Oui, uh, Régent Hébert de la Radio Sec Régent Hébert, Sec Aero, you're talking about placing your plan or to put it uh, implemented in 12 to 18 months. You also say that the 24% of uh, seniors occupy hospital beds. Do you believe that these people uh, won't be there in the next 18 months, that the 24% of these people will still be in the hospital in uh, 12 to 18 next months? There are provinces that have succeeded to decrease the, the hospitalization rate of uh, people who require uh, nursing uh, care, nursing home care, uh, in an important uh, fashion on a very relatively short period. We don't believe it's going to be 0% uh, in 18 months, but some small hospitals have succeeded in phenomenal successes uh, elsewhere. Uh, now, if at least we would prevent uh, new admissions, uh, the attri attrition uh, can bring significant results in a year to year and a half. We will still have people who would occupy some of those beds. Uh, would the uh, rate be 20, uh, 18, or 16? We are not uh, quite sure yet uh, of the possible success rate. But the projects that were implemented elsewhere have shown uh, two very important things. After 90 days of return to home, to their home, if you can uh, send people back home uh, that need uh, intensive care, after 90 days, uh, quite often, there's at least 90% of these people who are still at home, in their homes. So it's quite remarkable as... Uh, as a success. The other thing, too, is that we know that these people are more mobile than they were. And so uh, there's the uh, gain back uh, uh, their autonomy that they would have lost had they stayed in the hospital. I don't know if somebody else wants to add to that. I might give a concrete example with regards to that particular situation. If you take the example of the Grand Falls General Hospital that has 20 beds at the present time, a few years ago the beds were almost all occupied by patients who were in a waiting uh, for uh, placement on 20 beds. We were at 10, 12, sometimes 15 patients who were awaiting placement. Initiatives were undertaken with uh, social development to improve uh, the, to, uh, the uh, increase the uh, hours of care either at home or in other special uh, care homes, which allowed uh, to free up these patients uh, as quickly as possible and bring them home or in an appropriate level of care. It also allowed to avoid some hospitalizations because we could work with these people at the very beginning and as soon as they were brought into emergency with social development or with the physician, we've had success. At uh, present time in Grand Falls, we're at four or five patients, six patients who are awaiting placement and it is uh, continuing work. Uh, the key to success here resides in the fact that the person can return at home quite quickly after hospitalization. And in order to do so, it has to be done quickly. We must be able to implement uh, quite a, a whole series of services that will uh, help that person. And in the first uh, 30 to 45 days, uh, we'll have to increase the number of hours of support. And it is in doing that that we allow to give the chance to the person of uh, not uh, uh, taking a decision to be placed in a nursing home or a long-term care home in a situation where uh, that person is uh, quite uh, vulnerable. We, we're not saying it can't go. The person can't go there, but uh, that decision is always better taken when you're at home and not in a hospital bed. Beatrice Seymour, Académie Nouvelle. Uh, have you costed what represents finally the 99 suppression of beds and if that will uh, bring out uh, some job losses? Globally, and I am rounding fingers off, 
Uh, these are the savings of five million dollars annually, and we must uh, reinvest a half of that to, to put in place these alternatives. As to the uh, suppression of positions, it's too early to say. What we know right now, some positions or categories of positions where we do have uh, vacancies, uh, that is to say they're not filled, and uh, we must work in uh, respecting uh, uh, union contracts that have been signed. Uh, we uh, there's still some time where before we can uh, assess the uh, the full impact on staffing. I would like to add what Mr. Lanting uh, mentioned as to a redeployment of uh, our human resources, uh, just to uh, continue to what Dr. Rosier was mentioning in the Restigouche uh, zone. We have a lot of people who could have received uh, ambulatory care at home and were hospitalized. And we have implemented with very modest means uh, some services in place. And the last results show that we've been able to <coughs> uh, reduce 10% of uh, hospitalizations. The point I want to make is when we wanted to make these ambulatory care uh, challenges, the the challenges we've had, it was to the detriment of our capacity to be able to uh, to be put uh, to be able to put uh, in place the necessary staffing. So if we can redeploy our human resources uh, differently, results show that in the last initiatives they are quite modest, but we have succeeded in uh, decreasing the number of hospitalizations. Uh, that's always uh, the challenge. Transformation and modernization of uh, and closing uh, of the beds and uh, putting in place some alternative to hospitalization cost and save. So the uh, annualized saving, that means when it's fully operational, it w should generate approximately $10 million um, uh, dollars annually, but there's a reinvestment of appro approximately half of, that am uh, uh, half of that amount to develop these, the new services that have to be put in place. So that's why people are looking at me. I thought I'd given it right back. It's $10 million, and we would reinvest $5 million. Thank you for pointing that out to me. How will you go about, you said a while ago that the hospital, targeted hospitals have not been determined. How can you determine which hospitals uh, where you're going to reduce those beds? Are you uh, fearing that there could be some movements of frustrations in the communities? How will you go about to avoid that? To identify specifically which hospital it will be done, we'll pursue our work with regards to information that we, we've already uh, have in place uh, as to the utilization. The other element, so we, we have a lot of information, a lot of data. We'll continue our analysis, and from that we can refine which services uh, uh, where we could close those bids or transform them in other options. There will be conditions that we'll look at so as, so that we, we believe, we, we know that we'll discuss with the communities and the professionals to see which are the better options. Will this bring about frustration? I don't think so. Will it uh, bring about some temporary uh, concerns? Uh, of course, yeah, but uh, when they see the alternative, uh, well, they, uh, people will accept it more readily. And already uh, people uh, are in a situation uh, and will want to see uh, these transformation more quickly. It's a question of uh, coordinating, coordinating it well, and in order to maximize our chance of success, we'll have to do it in consultation with the uh, stakeholders and the uh, institutions involved. 
I have a second question, Julien Lapointe, uh, Radio Canada. Uh, there's also, in the last couple of weeks, people who have uh, uh, concerns, but some people have said that your plan could give me ammunition to the Department of Health uh, to cut back beds and also to cut back emergency services. How can you, we avoid such a scenario? Well, let's say that I think that the government, the department, and all of the stakeholders, we uh, it's uh, an advantage for us to find the best solution. Nobody goes out of their way uh, to create problems in these difficult times. I um, and now if we propose options that we're going to transform and modernize and improve services. Uh, I think it's a win-win situation, but we, it has to be communicated, it has to be explained. Uh, people have to understand that with alternatives, people are not in a worse condition than what they perceive today. And we talked about uh, uh, the customs and, and ways of people. Uh, hospital systems were built around hospitals. Today, we have to transform them. I would add to that, you know, people in the population, quite often, uh, people want to stay at home, seniors. To go to a nursing home is, an, is a final option. I hear that quite often. So if we can improve the system where we can offer more services at home than what we're offering right now, people uh, will probably be able to stay at home uh, quite longer, more happy, uh, better manage their own situation and condition. And to be critical uh, to ourselves, if we, do, if we don't go, do a good work, a good job, uh, uh, we'll miss the boat. That's where we want to go, to do a good job in that sense, uh, and on the long-term basis to do that change, transformation, and modernization. Because uh, this present situation today, we can't maintain that for a long time. I think the population wants that too. There's an attachment with institutions, but people, we want to be closer to the community. We'll have to look at the community needs. We're looking at that now. If we have to bring services closer to the community, we'll do that. But the status quo is not acceptable today. Uh, for these seniors that it's deemed that that's not appropriate to be in the hospital, um, do you think there's enough feasible alternatives for alternative care for them that they can be fully supported in, the, in that changeover? Uh, we think that there are, uh, there are uh, enough uh, different types of service that could be put in place to meet these needs. Right there now, what we're saying is they're not fully developed. The gamut is not wide enough. Uh, we can think of uh, respite care. We could think of daycare. We could think of uh, day center, day, uh, uh, day hospitals. There are so many things that could be put in place that could offer uh, that, that alternative to, uh, to the population. And, and this is why we don't want to close these beds or transform these beds without having these options uh, fully thought out and, and, and analyzed on, on the precise impact that it, that it could have on the elderly. Uh, we're talking to a number of colleagues over the past couple of weeks and, and uh, you know, uh, it, it has been, if you ask people would they rather stay home uh, in, in their home, in the security of their homes, if they had the proper services, uh, almost unanimous, unanimously they will say yes. However, what the family or the caregivers will tell you, we are not supported enough. We need more support to be able to keep our parent, keep our elderly at home, and this is precisely what we want to put in place. And that's why in, in our plan that we intend to reinvest some of the savings and mostly in the community-based services. Uh, when we talk with physicians, they're quite in line of where we want to go. They often say that uh, if that patient could get a few more hours of, of home care, we could probably discharge this patient a lot e earlier. So that's, we need, we need to have that collaboration with, with social development, uh, uh, Ambulance New Brunswick, ourself, and all other partners, and not just think about ourselves as health authority. Avec les, uh, les journalistes en salle en... Uh, some uh, media online. Any questions? Is that it? Merci. 
Uh, thank you. It's still Beatrice uh, Seymour from L'Acadie LA. If I understood well, uh, according to your presentation, you maintain emergency services as, as is, but after the implementation of your plan, uh, suppression of beds, among others, you will reassess the situation. Is that it? Yes, what we're proposing is to maintain emergency services as is. That is to say, in terms of uh, uh, operation hours, uh, what we want to do is implement services that will allow the, the decrease of the number of visits, also have visits that are more appropriate for emergency services. So once it's put into place, we'll assess the impacts and see, along with our partners, how we can go further. Most of clinicians we talked with see, uh, they don't see how we can close emergencies at the present time without putting into place these alternative options. And we agree on that. And what we're proposing is to really work with Ambulance in Brunswick uh, like uh, Stefan said earlier, and to uh, work with uh, uh, community health and clinicians so that they can uh, prepare, uh, reserve uh, uh, some programs for patients who need to be seen and organize ourselves uh, during the weekend if somebody needs uh, quick services as to home care, which would uh, uh, avoid emergency visits uh, and, and a reassessment, if we, can we go further? Is it uh, viable to go further? And what that would generate as uh, other opportunities once everything is in place. And you don't know for now what share will take the suppression of uh, beds, uh, 41 beds in the Akadi Bathurst uh, region. So it presupposes that they're in the uh, Bathurst Hospital, but you are uh, doing a, a 230 million extension uh, right now. Uh, was that taken into account, or will that be taken into account? Because it would mean uh, that that space is less important. Uh, at the present time in Bathurst, uh, and I'll ask Stefan to add if there's something that I forget, but what happens there as well? At one point, uh, when uh, a hospital is too old, uh, new standards are developed that makes it so that for the safety and the quality of care, uh, the rooms, uh, uh, four bed rooms, because of infection, uh, foresee rooms that are more appropriate and more. Uh, uh, washrooms uh, and bathrooms, and uh, we'll, there will always be needs. Uh, there is uh, ambulatory care that can be de given in hospital milieu, and the utilization of space will not be a problem, of course, but uh, there will be a great improvement as to the services that will be given there. Of course, the plan for the uh, Bathurst Hospital is, has been built for five or six years. So the plan was to build a 215-bed institution, and uh, there is no addition of bed. In a transformation like that, there would be an impact, maybe. But uh, that, that uh, expansion construction was built over five years, so there is still space there. There might be other initiatives as to ambulatory care, for instance. Uh, we can better perform. We'll have ambulatory care and uh, according to the new technologies, but some other aspects will come into play and uh, those spaces will not be idle. Uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, that's the time you're giving yourself, but within that, how do you make sure, because you talked about a culture change, uh, 12 to 18 months, is it enough to change a cultural uh, aspect? Uh, Maybe there might not be the beds necessary to welcome uh, the seniors. Uh, how to, do you make sure that everything falls in place so that no one will be penalized in that structural change? Some things can uh, be put in place quite quickly, and I'll give you an example. Let's say that someone in a nursing home needs 
uh, are falls and we need diagnostic exams, uh, there might be a way to organize that uh, quite quickly so that the person does not have to wait. So that could be one way to go give services uh, with more expertise, uh, nursing care in a nursing home, for instance, or give more support to a person who uh, wants to go into a nursing home. It's not a transformation that would necessitate uh, a lot of, of cost, but it could have a good impact. Uh, so uh, it's how we can have a quick impact to, to do that transformation. Well, at the present time, uh, do you already have some ideas? In the first month, we'll look at this, uh, first of all, to be able to uh, so that everything comes together along the way. In your 12 to 18 months plan, where do you start? Yes, we know where, where things would have more impacts, but they, it still remains to determine which uh, institution we are going to re-affect those bids. And uh, that's the basis that would allow us to do the readjustments. And it will be done during the next weeks. And already a lot of initiatives were launched by Social Development uh, uh, Home First uh, that we're implementing uh, with a lot of strategies in Acadian and Chalor region. And as Dr. De Rosier said, uh, we are also uh, for the last couple of months, uh, uh, assessing the type of clientele that during the stay duration, why do you uh, discharge or not discharge, and uh, looking at the types of patients and the reasons, and we're working with the community sector and extramural program to make sure that we can have a, a, an earlier discharge. Uh, there are people that are waiting for placement, but there are all types of people that are admitted uh, every day that we can manage. Uh, the uh, hospital stays are quite long in New Brunswick. It's a question of reducing that. There are two projects being done right now that has started a few weeks ago or even a month ago in some cases in two zones where we're looking at uh, the people who are quite sick and need services uh, uh, on frequent uh, fashion. And these people are, if we presented them to you in a certain way that use uh, um, uh, a lot more than proportionally speaking, emergency and hospital care. People who come to emergency seven or eight times a year and maybe more who are hospitalized ten times a year. And with these people, if we targeted them, uh, identified them, how can we better support them in the community? Of course, there are some works that have been done that are more advanced than another, but uh, there are things that we must continue to work on so to, in order to have uh, quick impacts. Those are two projects that will give us short-term results. Uh, the idea is to better know the needs of these clients and to work with clinic clinicians to see which uh, service is better for the level of care needed for those patients. Quite often, they come into an emergency because they don't realize that there are other options, and it's in working uh, as a team with clinicians and the patient and, the, and their family uh, so that we can uh, determine and reorient uh, differently the other uh, levels, levels of service. And it's all, always a question of going to the hospital. Sorry, it'll be my last one today. <laughs> Until tomorrow. Uh, within the program's uh, strategic program review, quite often people in New Brunswick have said that uh, according to them, the solution is to close hospitals in rural areas and to uh, close down emergency departments. Uh, it came out in that. Uh, why is it uh, that that is not what you're suggesting, whereas uh, some people might think it's the easiest solution instead of having a long-term plan? Uh, wh why are you stubborn to... Uh, keep those services. First of all, it's important to understand that we're targeting the whole of the network. All of institutions in the Vitality Network rather than 304. We believe that there are improvements to be made all over. We've looked at data, we've looked at the usage, uh, the profile of clients, and we believe that if we look at only three or four establishments, it's an option that's always possible and always there. But we'll miss uh, 
the opportunity of really transforming the whole of the organization and all its components because there are similar situations from one institution to another. It doesn't mean that uh, at the end of the line, transformation might not be important in one established than the, than the other. Uh, but at the beginning, we have uh, problems, we have challenges that are common. I believe also that some people think it's easy to target uh, rural milieus, uh, they're mistaken, very much so. And there are needs in that population as there are in urban centers like Moncton, Moncton. and there are people from Kent, uh, Acadian Peninsula, Restigouche, all, all over the place, uh, Northwest. We can't just come there and say we're going to close the hospitals. Uh, it's a nonsense today. In, that, in such an attitude because people are using emergency at level four and five. There's a reason for that. It's because they go elsewhere and there's no service. So as an organization, we have to look at those needs. It's very important to do so, uh, so that we allow the patients and their families to get services locally that uh, will be, uh, they'll be able to take charge of their situation. Dr. De Rosier can talk about that better than I can, but at the present time, that doesn't exist all over the place. So the problem we have is that people are looking at the emergency department because they have no place else to go. So we have a, a lot of work to be done uh, in that sense, very important work in the coming year, and uh, we have a lot of work to do. I, I believe that uh, covers everything, unless uh, there are other uh, media reps that want to, just the, if you're talking about 12 to 18 months, will that period, um, is that uh, for the start of these initiatives? Uh, we'll start as soon as we have the authorization. It'll take 12 to 18 months to implement completely. So thank you for your participation this afternoon, and have a good day.